Hi, my name is Zelman Ainsworth. Thanks for joining for another episode of Retail Stories. Today I'm interviewing Teague Ezard, the founder and creator of Ginger Boy and Ezard, one of Melbourne's culinary fathers who's created the Flinders Lane Precinct. We're going to be talking to Teague about his experience from 1999 when he opened his first restaurant all the way through today, all the learnings and lessons that Teague's learned along the way with the great successes he's achieved. It's a fantastic interview, which I'm really excited to share. When you started in 1999, you started Ezard. You opened up the Flinders Lane restaurant, which is um, somewhat a bit of a basement space. You were at the forefront of the culinary scene of, of Melbourne and of Flinders Lane, and you created what now is known as Flinders Lane. 1999, fast forward 2020, the business shuts down. What w that wouldn't have been a very easy experience to go through after such love and care and success that you've enjoyed there. What were the biggest lessons that came out of that entire experience? A lot. A lot. I don't know where to start, to be honest. But um, I will say the closure was on my terms, which was good. Um, 20 years was a time to call it. So I have no regrets for that. It was, it was time and, uh, and it was, it, it was a, a great journey. Many happy faces and, f and lots of familiar faces and stories over the journey, but uh, there's a lot of fond memories of the restaurant. And I think um, over the journey, there's a lot I've learnt. I think you've got to break it into five and ten years. I think in the first five years, it was about establishing yourself, um, learning to let go, learning to sort of do things at a different pace. I mean, going from a, from a, a chef, cook, to a restaurateur is a, is a big leap in the first sort of few years, as most young chefs will find that. Um, and in that first five years, learning to trust people, get good advice, just make the right friends as you go, um, and just create and back yourself, just, just really be creative and, and, and back yourself is a, a big thing. Mm. And I think in the, in the if I can cut it in, the, in a short break, so in, the, in the, the five to ten years, post the five years, it's all about cutting and crafting, you know, cutting into, the, into your brand and just making yourself do what you do and um, getting consistent. The consistency plays a big part in that five to ten year mm. mark and I think that's, that's where the, the success was. And if I look back 2005 to 2015, that was the golden years. You couldn't do anything wrong. So, you know, I had good pace for that period. There's a GFC in the middle of 2009, was it? Eight, nine, right? Eight or nine. Um, but it was a remarkable era of, of, of that 10 years. And in that 10 years, we rebranded, we renovated because it was the thing to do at the time. Um, we introduced degustation menus yeah. because degustation menus was was what everybody wanted. That was the trend, and um, and it continued. The consistency was the main point. And then the last sort of five years of the journey was what I learnt was how to pass that knowledge on, um, your skills to share um, to the people who you you know sort of trust. So to contribute back, not to. So it was important that. To um, a good lesson learned was to hand over some skill. It's all the things that you've learned over the journey, and it was kind of what it did in the last five years. Mm. And when did you start noticing competition on Flinders Lane? Like, when did that really start turning towards a culinary precinct? Well, I can tell you how it started. Langton started in one year before we did. Who's that? Langton's. Yes. In '98. So it was Langton's in Ezard, and it was in '99, and I think. From 99, um, gee whiz, I have to think back about that, but who, who, who came in? Um, there's Langton's, obviously. What about the place that where Garden State is now? Wasn't that some sort of like... Was it Rosati's? Rosati's? Yeah, Why that did was, that come in? Well, that was, that, I think that was uh, around us at the yeah. same, same time. They had, a big, they, they had a big impact for a while? Yeah, they did. It was a big, big, big venue, um, big market. They, they did very, very well. But I think um, there's a lot of bars smaller places first and then the restaurants came. Mm. So it's very eclectic street and very, very full of you know, character and now, now look at it. It's, I mean, when we started, uh, on a Saturday afternoon you could go up to Finders Lane and shoot a cannon down it. And now it's just full of wedding parties, cars, people, shoppers, it's, it's amazing. It's a great precinct. Mm -hmm. So if you can walk down Flinders Lane now and imagine it's 1999 and you bump into Teague Azard, what would you tell him knowing what you know today? 
I'd tell him um, that get ready for a few things. Get ready for uh, organic food because that, that played a big part. Um, get ready for technology to take over business. Um, you know, just get, get ready for massive, massive changes. I mean, coming from a, a kitchen, you know, working seven hours a week and all you, you're, you're in one zone, um, there's a big play in mental health in kitchens. You know, and now in the way that kitchens and restaurants, for that matter, are structured, everybody has certain rules and hours and days and everything to follow. Back then, there was no, no rule book. You went to work, you cooked, you went home. You came in at nine, you left at well, eight, left at 11, and that was it. So I think the big change is the industrial relations laws. Um, the big change in that time has been the way in which we cook um, the cuisines. I mean, back when 99, there was four or five major cuisines, you know, French, Italian, Chinese, the main players. Now there's 30 or 40 um, inf influential cuisines in, in CBD. So we've had a remarkable success in exposure to restaurants in the time. So, but um, one thing st one thing stayed the same, Zelma. And that's the craft and the passion, and you know the, the sort of desire to eat good food, and the, and the market was attracted to that. Mm. And that hasn't changed in 20 years. Nope. And no. probably longer than that. No. You've been through many, many changes throughout your long, successful career in hospitality. But I'm sure last year in 2020 would have been seen the most structural changes. So what are those biggest changes that come out of 2020 and that's adjust and how you adjusted your business to deal with those changes? COVID was the biggest change um, and, that, and that made a lot of adjustments for change. And the adjustments for change is learning how to run your business smaller. It's all shrunk. So uh, you had to improvise and learn different things and create new different things outside the business more, more as in home delivery. Um, learning to capture the market, rather than coming, them coming to you, you had to go to them. Mm. I mean, that was the biggest change in hospitality for not just myself, but a lot of operators, so... Is that going to stay, bringing I, premium restaurant experience to people's homes? Is that now the trend that's going to stay? I think now, now that everybody's had a taste of it, it'll stay, and it'll, it'll only grow. It'll only grow, and I think there's a great opportunity talking to the players in, in the field, like the home delivery logistics companies, talking to the founders of, of all of this, I mean, there, there's a great deal of confidence mm -hmm. that it'll be around for a long time and I have to agree with them. Is it a more profitable dish to sell delivered to someone's home or in a restaurant? Because there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a perception that all online, deliver, online is no overheads. This is online, they order from the computers, but logistically and delivering that experience to perfection seems to also come at a cost. Sure, I think, I mean, the, the biggest variable of the cost really is the overheads that need to create that within a restaurant and you charge for that. Yeah. Um, with the delivery service, obviously there's commissions depending on which model or platform you choose. Mm. Um, so there's costs incurred on both. Looking at the GP on, on both, I think the margin in the restaurant's probably a little bit better um, than home delivery. Obviously, obviously with home delivery as well, you need to not charge restaurant prices because you're not providing that add-on service and all the overheads which you're mm. paying for. So, mm. Now, if you can choose to change one thing in the hospitality market in Melbourne, what would that one thing be? One thing? Anything the, that bothered you all these years, you just wish you could have just ironed that crease out? The, the one thing I would have changed, I would have reversed the IR laws. I think, like parking tickets, everything gets increased every year. <laughs> And I, and I think, look, the cost of living is very, very high. We all know that. And so too are wages and the cost of, of operating a business. And I think the one thing that I would have liked to have changed is to have that a little more relaxed because I can, as I've seen over the journey of the 20 years, I've seen the increase in the operating cost of these venues and they're, they're, uh, they're very tight to run these days, not much margin. And it was never like that. Um, the other thing I would have changed is um, I would have loved to have seen a more casual variation on Ben Sherry's cuisine. I think the indigenous play on using native ingredients and that kind of thing hasn't been touched enough. And I think there's, it needs to be embraced now that we've had COVID. I think there's going to be more local um, options for local cuisines and local indigenous um, use of ingredients. Mm. And I think that's going to come, that's going to come up. 
watch that space. I think that's going to come. I think there's a lot less inter international influences going to happen in the last next two years. Mm. And I think a lot of things will stay at home and a lot of things will be smaller. Yeah, Ben's using produce from Ripon Lee Gardens, which is just mm -hmm. around the corner from his that's restaurant. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. uh, it's, it's a great concept that really brings it all to life. If you can give one message to landlords watching this, what would that be? Help out your tenant. I mean, one thing about landlords at the moment is they've got a long-term vision. Tenants don't. Tenants have got a short-term vision. So, long, um, you know, landlords have, a, have an investment that's long-term and um, tenants are generally shorter term than what the landlord is. And I think times will get better. Times are tough. Times will get better. And I just say to the landlord, please, you know, work and collaborate with your t tenant. Help him out. What can you do? Talk to him. What can you do together? Just to, just to get through this very, very awkward time. Um, have some lenience. Mm. Um, things will get better. Things will get better. Do you have a timeline in your own personal opinion of when that transition is going to happen from where we are now to when we're back to boom times? Oh, boom times, where that comes. I'd like to think this year, sometime, things will creep back. Certainly in the next six months, it's going to be a challenge. But the, the later quarters of this year, this calendar year, I'm really hoping to see some, some, uh, some increase in business. And what do you expect to see Fast forward to 2025, you walk into a restaurant on Crosley Lane, what's that going to look like? What are you, in your mind, what are you planning for? <clears throat> right now, I think we're trying to focus on shortening the product and actually focusing on what's important is a smaller version of what you do. Concentrate on the version. Staff have shrunk, the, the team has shrunk, the revenue shrunk, the customers have shrunk, everything's shrinking. So I think what's going to come out of that is a more concentrated effort on on what we do here. Um, so I think what's, look at 2025, I can't tell you that. I can tell you 2022 will be a more refined model. And I think that the refined model is going to replicate and smaller, smaller other options can incentivize a bigger picture. So smaller venues, smaller concepts, yep. Yep. more intimate? Probably faster. That's probably one thing I probably would have wanted to see in a, more than what I've done and focused on the last 10 years is a faster model of what we do. Um, there's great merit in convenience and I think what I've seen in the marketplace in the last 10 years is people want a, a quicker, faster, more convenient model, so uh, experience. Mm -hmm. And I have to agree that now's the time to be able to multiply and incentivize that. Precincts throughout the entire CBD have some of Australia's best restaurants. Can you start seeing a trend where those restaurants start appearing in suburbs like Hawthorne Q, Turak, South Yarra, um, Balaclava, Ripon Lee, all those areas? Can you start seeing that trend where these major CBD restaurants go into the suburbs? 100%. 100%. I mean, if you look at Providor as one platform, for example, all of the deliveries are in areas that are nine, 15 kilometres away. That's where, where it's, it, it is at its busiest. Mm. Um, not in the city, not in the inner city, but, but away from the city. So the suburbs, I mean, that's where everybody lives, right? So um, I think with COVID, living at home, being more, being more sort of uh, closer to home in your environment. I mean, if you, if you have a look around local suburbs now and your, your local environment, the cafes are busy. Yeah. Um, they're busy from, from morning, noon to night. So I think that that's, uh, that's certainly changing. And as far as your own restaurants and brands and concepts, what does the next two years look like for you? Would you consider expanding? Would you consider looking at new spaces? And if so, where? Uh, I consider myself an explorer at the moment. Um, not a pioneer. But uh, just looking at how it all looks is, is certainly out of the CBD. I think a um, little out or even a lot out is probably where I'd like to be, where I'd like to focus. So I think in the city at the moment, doing something such as a flagship model um, that can multiply or be very, very different to what you would normally do mm -hmm. is, a good, is a good opportunity. And what would your message be to a young um, entrepreneur that wants to get into the hospitality industry right now? Uh, be patient. Um, get your plan, like I always say, get your plan ready to go. Don't expect to make a million bucks overnight because quite frankly, I don't see much profit made in the next two years in this industry. 
Mm -hmm. I think we need to understand your costs, your break-even points, your margins, all of your KPIs, and don't rush it. I mean, the first thing is do not rush it. It's not like just jumping in and going, let's, let's do this. Mm. It all comes together. It doesn't happen like that anymore. It's, it takes a measured approach, um, listen to the right people, get the good advice, and don't run out of money. What do you think the Council of Melbourne can do to help encourage and enhance the um, hospitality industry here in the CBD? Well, I think what they're doing, they're, they're doing now is pretty good. I mean, even just announcing this morning um, additional extra time for those outdoor pop-ups yeah, they're great. Um, for restaurants. I mean, by extending that is, is, is helping. Um, that's just a, a great, great opportunity for the restaurateurs and also too for the public to come and experience that safely. If, if, you can, if I can say safely like that. Um, what else can they do? They just need to bring back as much as we can to the city. I'll be pushing for theatres to be opening. Um, we need the shops. We need the shops um, engaged. We need business, which is happening. 75% officers now return in the private sector. So slowly but surely it's all coming. And I think it's not going to happen overnight, but it is happening. It's just good to see progress, and I think the council is behind that. Mm -hmm. um, I can just say, just keep building incentives for more and more people to come into the city. It's very important to get them coming in. Yeah. I, I think we're starting to see that. We certainly have a very passionate and committed Lord Mayor that's driving that from yeah. the front of the line, yeah, um, who's constantly tr trying things just to bring people back and support those that are here yeah. holding the fort, which is great. And um, you know, walking around town today, you can see that's really working well, so I, in my personal opinion, I think she's doing a great job. Yeah, I think she is, and I think we just need more and more of it, but, I, you know, we just need more, more, more foot traffic, as she keeps saying, more foot traffic, but more engagement, more the theatres, the arts, precincts, the offices, it's, it's all the shops, it's, it's all happening. Cool. Teague, thank you very much for participating in this interview. It's always a pleasure seeing you, and it's great to understand, you know, your thought process and how you go about building these brands and businesses so successfully. So thank you, and good luck for the rest of the year. Thanks, Elman. You too. Cheers.